Lakeland Currents, your public affairs program for North Central Minnesota. Produced by Lakeland Public Television with host Ray Gildow. Production funding for Lakeland Currents is made possible by Bemidji Regional Airport, serving the region with daily flights to Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport. More information available at BemidjiAirport.org. Closed captioning for Lakeland Currents is sponsored by Niswa Tax Service. Tax preparation for businesses and individuals. Online at NiswaTax.com. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Lakeland Currents, where tonight we have an unusual event. Unusual for me, and this is my 11 years, my 11th year of doing this show, and we've been running a series on PBS about Vietnam. And I had an opportunity to invite a friend of mine here this evening who is a Vietnam veteran, uh, who was involved in combat, and um, I didn't really know if I should ask him to do this. I didn't know if he would be comfortable doing it. And just for the record, he has never publicly gone anywhere and talked about this before. So it's kind of, it's a first for uh, Lakeland Public Television and it's first for us. And my guest this evening is Buford Johnson, who, as I said, is also a friend of mine, uh, a fellow bowler. <laughs> <laughs> Although neither one of us are gonna brag about bowling. But Buford, Buford has a very, very interesting background. Before we talk about his Vietnam experience, I want to just give you a short synopsis of some of the things that he has done. In 1967, he, uh, he enlisted in 1960, I believe. 60, yeah. And he left Fort Benning and was employed by Mankato State as a political science instructor. In 1968, he ran for the U.S. Congress in the 6th District. He was the endorsed DFL candidate. Uh, in 1969 to 71, he worked for the Center for the Study of Local Government at St. John's University. In 1972, he was selected to attend the Army Command and General Staff College. And where is that located? Fort Leavenworth. Fort Leavenworth. In 73 to 82, he sold real estate. In 1982, he became a financial planner. And in 2015, he became, uh, what do you call yourself, a farmer? A, a gentleman farmer. A gentle, gentleman farmer. And he uh, now raises chickens and Ducks, he's got a geese. couple of mules, <laughs> mules. And, and he's living the good life. But he has a, an incredible story uh, about Vietnam. And uh, let's just maybe back up to before you went into the military, you had an interesting uh, well, plan I'll, of what you were going to do. I was going to be a monk. I wanted to. <laughs> be a monk out of St. John's, and that worked out quite well up until about the, uh, I, I, was, I was working quite well until they said, I don't think you fit here, <laughs> and, they, <laughs> and they asked me to leave, so I went to uh, college at St. John's, I finished off there. I, uh, I was, they had a rifle team at the time, and I was on the rifle team, and I had a couple other friends that were on it, and uh, anyway, we used to beat the ROTC team quite bad on the rifle range. And I get a call from a Colonel Lorimer at St. John's, who's a, what they call him, Commandant, head of the ROTC program. Mm -hmm. You want to know why it wasn't ROTC? I said, I don't qualify. First couple of years, I, I was in the seminary. And he worked out a deal with me. And I love deals. And, you know, kind of a Trump thing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, um, the deal was this. I wouldn't have to attend class. I wouldn't have to do any drilling. He wanted me to organize an ROTC team. He wanted to beat the University of Minnesota. I would have match ammo that we could use on the college team. If are are these handguns or are they rifles? These are rifles, rifles? 22 rifles. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, but I, I would have to take all the exams and there was no cheating on the exams. It, I mean, it was on the up and up there. And uh, he had a sergeant that was sponsoring the, uh, or that was overseeing the rifle team, ROTC rifle team. And uh, the sergeant was working with me on, on so I, I could read the material and he would review things with me and then I'd take the exams. But no drill, no nothing. Hmm. And it worked out pretty good. Uh, we, uh, we beat the University of Minnesota and um, so I'm in ROTC. And, uh, and where was your hometown? Where did St. You? Cloud. Oh, you were born in St. Cloud. St. Cloud, okay. yeah. And anyway, <laughs> uh, make a long story short, my senior year we... Uh, Came in second in the nation. Wow. Got beat by uh, Nebraska. And uh, it was my fault that we got beat because uh, <laughs> the spotter <laughs> just shot him. Uh, I had about three <laughs> rounds to go, and he said, uh, boy, and I'm shooting offhand. He said, keep it up. He said, you, you, you've got a perfect score going. 
I put the rifle up and I couldn't even, I couldn't even find the bull. <laughs> I mean, it was like buck fever. Yeah. I think I blew the next one and got some points in the next two. And uh, we lost by one point to Nebraska. But you just took second into the nation. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, uh, and I jokingly say, well, I, I, I left the seminary and I went into the Army because the hours were the same <laughs> <laughs> up early in the morning. Uh, but I, uh, I never thought I'd really enjoy uh, the military. That's not my intent to start with. I went to uh, Port Riley, Kansas for a uh, summer training with ROTC. I did quite well there, and I came back and decided I wanted to go regular army. And I remember the colonel telling me, "You can't do that. I was supposed to go six months oh. as a reservist." They said, "No, I, I qualify for RA, uh, regular army." And I went in and as a regular army officer. So did you start out then as a second, second lieutenant, lieutenant in yeah. uh, Fort Benning? Did you go to Fort Benning? No, well, I, I, I got there, but uh, I went to Fort Benning. I went to jump school, ranger school. Okay. Then I was assigned to a, shouldn't say this either, I guess, but uh, assigned to a uh, the, the 12th Infantry at uh, Fort Riley, Kansas, the big red one, and they were on their way to Korea. And unfortunately, I got caught in a place off limits with the commanding general's daughter. Uh-oh. <laughs> and I remember the following morning on a, on a Friday, Saturday morning at 5 o'clock, I think it was 6 o'clock, we had formation. And uh, I got a call to go talk to Colonel Bellier was his name, a big boy, about six foot six, six seven, big guy. I walked in and he said, Lieutenant, two ways to become well known on this post. One is to do an outstanding job. The other is to screw up royally. You're well known on this post. This is the following morning. <laughs> wow. He says, you're well known on this post at this time. <clears throat> and you haven't been here long enough to do an outstanding job. <laughs> so take it for what it's worth, go back to your unit. And, wow. And then shortly after, I was transferred to, uh, to Germany. And I found out that general officers can transfer somebody for their own good. Oh. And I understand that his daughter had gotten some other officers in trouble. Wow. So, so I wasn't the Lone Ranger there. So you went to Germany? And I went to Germany. and I was Now you, were, you ended up in Special Forces, didn't yeah, you? Yeah. I had no idea what they were. I thought it was special services where you pass out volleyballs. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And uh, anyway, uh, I went in and I walked in and they started talking. You know, they, I was supposed to report there. They had a helicopter pick me up out of Grafenbeer, um to go to Bad Tolfs. And I, what, what's going on? I mean, um, I thought my escapade in Fort Riley was catching up with me. <laughs> and uh, I walked in this room and they people in the room were talking Polish to me. And I, well, I, I, I knew it was Polish, but I don't speak it. My grandfather and the relatives came from Poland. And um, so I told them, you know, I, I know you're talking Polish, but I don't speak it. And they want to know if I would join Special Forces. I'd have to be a volunteer. And I said, I don't know what it is. <laughs> and you got to tell me, we can't, it's classified. Oh, really? So we went round and round on this. And then uh, basically what I was going to get was an assignment to a, a, a Polish study team. You know, I would learn Polish and uh, they had a whole network of things. But if the balloon went up, this Cold War, if the balloon went up into Poland, we would have gone. And so, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, that sounds interesting. So I took it and so did that require a lot more rigorous training? Well, you, you go through a whole gamut, of not only rigorous, but see what, what they made a lot of special forces into like a ranger unit. Mm -hmm. Basically what they are is highly <clears throat> qualified individuals that can train somebody else. Our mission was to train others. Others. Mm -hmm. And um, I wasn't in the unit very long and the, uh, Colonel Simpson, I don't know why, but he took a liking to me. He was a C team commander. I ended up in his operations office. And then he was assigned uh, the mission of developing counterinsurgency doctrine for the armed forces. Hmm. And uh, so I went with him and we, we did a lot, of, a lot of traveling, checking on special forces teams that were committed. And now was your rank still the second I lieutenant? Was, doing I was uh, at that time, uh, yeah, I, was, no, I just made first lieutenant. Okay. So I was probably a junior, I know I was a junior officer in the operation. Mm -hmm. 
and there weren't very many Americans, I mean, uh, native-born. Uh, most of them were a lot of Finns, Lithuanians, uh, foreign-born. I had a uh, fellow I worked with that had served in seven different armies at one wow. you know, at time. He was a saboteur wow. during World War II. <clears throat> and um, so it was an interesting group of people. But uh, I got to travel to the Middle East, into Africa, and Southeast Asia. So what was the next adventure for you then after that experience? I volunteered out of Special Forces to stay in Vietnam as an advisor. Uh, when I saw what was going on in, in, in Southeast Asia, it was, uh, um, I, I realized Vietnam really needed some help. Huh? Some help. Uh, what, what year would that have been roughly? That then? would have been, uh, well, First time would have been about 63, then in 64, 65. Because uh, I think it was in June of 65 that it really started to oh, no. gear up uh, yeah. really well, big time. It, it was uh, prior to that. Um, actually, the first, <clears throat> just before my time, but when the war transitioned from guerrilla war to a conventional war, and we never, our whole American structure never adapted to the fact that we weren't fighting insurgents. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the insurgents or the guerrilla thing was a, was a tactic used to keep us uh, spread out and uh, didn't want us to mass our forces because uh, it became a conventional war, I think, in 1960 when, they, when the uh, uh, Viet Cong unit in the south, in the Delta area, um, stood and fought a Vietnamese, South Vietnamese battalion and defeated it. And the realization at that point for the Vietnamese was that this we, we are now in a conventional war. Wow! And but the Americans never accepted that. I don't understand. Um, and we were doing our study on counterinsurgency, and, and uh, that was really a you know disguise for for a conventional war. Hmm. So what the what the um, <laughs> what the guerrillas were to do, or the insurgents were supposed to do, was harass us so that they could build up their their hardcore forces. So in, uh, I think it was January of 65, early or late part of 64, the 305B North Vietnamese Division uh, hit and uh, the, the Vietnamese were able to stop them. But they came in through the Bamatuit area with, with, a, with a full division and there were other uh, regiments that came through. And um, you know conventional forces, but we were training the South Vietnamese to fight <laughs> guerrilla war, and you know they you know, supposed to you know pacify the villages and this type of thing. It really wasn't what the war was about. And uh, what people don't realize, Ho Chi Minh was a genius. I mean, uh, it was a, he was a uh, unbelievable organizer, and. Uh, when his uh, general, uh, was it Gap? Yep, General Gap. Uh, was a tremendous statistician. I mean, this guy knew how to, how to fight a war. But they also understood the most important weapon that, we, that they had was, was propaganda. And to the point, and infiltration. And they did a beautiful job of it. Um, it must have been really tough for soldiers not to know who was the friends and who were the enemies. <laughs> I mean, that was just something you dealt with all yeah. the time. You know, the, the word, <clears throat> you know, the Vietnamese language is interesting. Uh, ban and ban, and I don't know which one is which, I mean, in terms of the accent. One, one when ban is friend, and ban is shoot. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I mean, the words are close. But for, for a Vietnamese, they could pick it up on the accent on it. But sure. I, I couldn't understand it. So when I heard somebody holler ban, I, I just ducked. <laughs> 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 I'd wait and see what happened. But... Uh, no, there is an interesting situation, uh, you, and, but you didn't know if you know when you're dealing with the Vietnamese. You know, you're right. right. What's what, or who's who? Right. Uh, you get to you get to know the individuals, but um, you know what you didn't want to do is you didn't want to go into a, a village with by yourself somewhere and have some little kid hang a grenade on you. Um, 
you know, anyway. Because that happened all the time, didn't it? Yeah, it happened. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you get the thing off, and what are you going to do with it? You, yeah. You know, you can throw it into a crowd of people. Yeah. Uh, so after you became an advisor in Vietnam, um, did you see the war developing as it was? Did anybody that was there, did they see this oh, yes. escalating to the oh, level? Oh, yeah, very much so. <clears throat> very much so. Uh, I know uh, it had to be in probably November of 64. Uh, I was with a, uh, um, a regiment in Bong San. In the, I forget the province, but it was a hotbed for, for the communists. It was really uh, supportive of the, of the North Vietnamese. And <clears throat> we'd set up in a uh, defensive position, and we were supposed to secure Highway 1. And to the north of us, about four or five miles, we had a company on a big hill. And I, I went over there one uh, one evening and uh, to spend time with the company commander and see how things were going. And the, the, the night I was there, we, we went down to check the uh, the outposts, and they had landlines, you know, with the telephones. Mm -hmm. And we went down to check the first one, see how he was doing it. We got there, and the uh, whoever got in didn't cut the wire. They cut the cord on the on the phone itself. Oh. But but the uh, on the first one there were two two fellows there, uh, two Vietnamese, and their throats were slit. And and. Uh, oh really? So we we hustled. You know, couldn't call back. Uh, we hustled over to the next one, and uh, their throats had just been slit, and uh, just. And so we must have just missed it because they were still, you know, the blood was still gushing out. Oh, really? Yeah. So you're right so, behind So we it. were right there. And then uh, the shooting started, uh, the mortars and the attack on the, on the hill itself. And so we were outside of the, you know, the enemy between us and the hill. Mm -hmm. And the company commander said, you know, I got to get, I got to get back up there. I said, no, you're not going to make it up there. Um, no, he said, I'm going up. I said, I'm going to just hang tight right here. And uh, he went up and they overran the hill and, and uh, they were either killed or captured and, and uh, marched them off. But the uh, company commander was, was the, the colonel's nephew, I guess it was. He was pretty upset about it. And, but uh, they hauled him off. I don't know whatever happened to him. Hmm. The Never did hear. Never did hear, no. Wow. But, then just from a point of view of mental process, you know, when I should have been scared, I mean, I should have been afraid. You know, I don't remember feeling afraid, but I, I do remember thinking that you know, I really admired the skill of the enemy. You know, I would think, well, they did, you know, these are remarkable, well-trained individuals. That this, what they did is not easy to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, usually there should be a sound or you know, somebody would have fired a round or something. But it was redone really in stealth. Yeah, all stealth, and uh, so we weren't de we weren't dealing with amateurs. We were yeah. dealing with professionals. And uh, so, how did you go from uh, being an advisor then, and did you end up being in charge of a platoon? No, or uh, no, I was never in charge. You never I'm, were in charge. No. So you, how did you end up in your actual combat experience and when you had your... Well, we, we, I was with the unit when we got engaged in combat. Okay. And, uh, <clears throat> and you were still an advisor? Still an advisor, and did, yeah. And did you yeah. have South Vietnamese in that unit plus Americans? Well, I had a, I had a team of uh, five people. Oh, okay. I had a radio operator. I had a lieutenant, sergeant, and uh, usually an interpreter. But uh, there were... It was amazing because a n number of Vietnamese that spoke English or, or some English, mm -hmm. and I tried to speak speak uh, Vietnamese. It's Tough a, language to learn, isn't well, it? it? Well, it's tonal. Yeah. And right now, I have a hard time hearing, much less being able to handle the tonal. Sure. You know, so, yeah. was it that unit that you were with then that ended up getting separated from someone else that you ended up being? Well, we we went up. This is later on. We were up in the highlands, and uh, um, it would have been it would have been uh, west of Bami to it. And uh, the unit I was with, just when I, my last tour over there, I, uh, we got overrun by the uh, North Vietnamese Division. 
we didn't know. We, we, we first we engaged a uh, reinforced company, and it was the advanced uh, company, advanced force for the mm -hmm. for the division. And we hit it, and it delayed us while the division surrounded us. A whole division surrounded you. Yeah, yeah, and we got trapped. And how many were there in your group that were trapped? Well, it was the 45th Regiment, uh, so it was a good sized unit. But uh, and then, how long were you actually trapped in this environment? Well, we fought, and I remember uh, Colonel Ba when we realized what was going on. We, we we were looking for reinforcements, and we couldn't get them because they were tying everybody up uh, all over the country. And that was and, our strategy. Yeah, and. Um, couldn't get the support we needed, and but when they when they decided to come in, I remember telling the on my channel, telling them don't don't come in piecemeal, come in with a strong force to break us out. But they for some reason piecemeal, they didn't believe that there was that large a force up there because wow. there was no intelligence indicating the force was going to be there. Wow, and so it was a total surprise. And how long were you actually? surrounded well, there in that environment? It was about 30 days. 30 days? Yeah. And you don't have an absolute recollection of no, all of it, I, do you? I, I just know it. I because was up there and, you got caught in mortar, Well, right? I got caught in a mortar barrage, yeah. And uh, I don't know if I had a concussion or what, but uh, yeah, we... Uh, and you said that, uh, when we were talking about this one other time, you said that when they would try to radio you at night, the Viet Cong would intercept those. Oh, we, we didn't dare respond to anything. Because then they could oh, yeah, figure they out know where exactly where we were because they were looking for us. Yeah. Because the, uh, we could monitor until the batteries ran out um, what was going on. And uh, out of Quang Nai, they, we had a um, intel officer there, the major, and I don't know what his name was, but fortunately. Uh, but he kept telling the helicopters that you know, we're still missing 10 Americans. Um, is that yeah. how many were left of you that yeah. didn't Those get rescued? Yeah, ten. Yeah, and mm -hmm. uh, see, if it was yeah, you know, my advisory team and, an, and another advisory team from a, another battalion. But um, you know, we haven't found the, the ten Americans yet. Keep your eye out for them. Well, every time he'd say that in the open on the air, that told the Viet Cong you were there. They, yeah, well, they, they they'd come looking for us. Wow. And, Could uh, you hear them at night? Were they ever close enough to, so that you knew they were somewhere? Bur oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, <laughs> real close. But sometime, one time they were making a sweep, and, and one of the Vietnamese that was still alive saw that we were going to be caught, jumped up and hollered and ran off. I remember that. Saved and, your lives. And ran off, and the, 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 the North Vietnamese ran after him. Of course, I heard the shooting, and he was out of ammo. We were, we were, we were out of ammo a long time. and. Um, but, but I remember uh, Colonel Ba uh, telling the troops, you know, we can try to withdraw right now or we can hold, hold this division here until reinforcements do come up. But if we withdraw now, they might split the country in half. Wow. And every commander that was there said, we'll stay and fight to the last man. Wow. And, you know, this, this is the, the Vietnamese I, I remember. Uh, the commander of this, of the battalion. So these are very noble. Yeah, Vietnamese military. They, they they knew they knew what the North Vietnamese would know, do to them. Would do to them, but um, when <laughs> when I took over the advisory unit uh, at uh, with the to it, uh, the uh, Dai Wei Mi said to me, "Don't talk to me about tactics." <clears throat> he said, "I've been fighting twelve years. I fought against the French." And now I'm fighting against the North. He said, I understand tactics. I need weapons. I need logistics. He said, you keep me supplied, That's and I'm going to keep fighting. Wow. And basically, early in the war, we didn't give the Vietnamese, not only didn't give them decent weapons, but uh, we limited their supply because they wanted to go north. You know, I've never heard anybody talk about that. But, but they didn't have the resources to do it. Didn't have the resources to do it. <clears throat> and the other thing, that, it was interesting because they wanted to go after the North Vietnamese in Cambodia and Laos. They wanted to you know, really cut the, the supply line off uh, in, in Laos. And the Americans were just absolutely opposed to that. And <clears throat> 
not only did they supply the um, going down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, they used to ship in supplies. They had camouflage those ships like like uh, um, islands. Oh, really? Yeah, little little, little islands. And uh, the one out of I think it was out of Tuiwa, where they they, <coughs> they spotted the Vietnamese spotted the ship, and they, one of the Air Force uh, Vietnamese Air Force pilots spotted this ship because it had come up out of the water when they wow. unloaded. Wow. Well, they, they sunk the ship, but it was already unloaded, and we were rushed in to uh, try to save some of the uh, villagers because they, they went into the village, rounded up the villagers to that, haul the stuff up into the hills. Oh. And um, anyway, uh, we were going to push after them, and uh, we were going to use uh, gas. Now, you may probably remember this in the newspapers, I don't know. But uh, we were going to use uh, tear gas. And it was canisters that they were using, the, the military police were using, and they were kind of a makeshift device to spread them out. But we were going to break up the hold on the civilians. But we couldn't, we couldn't make the attacker go after him or use the tear gas until the reporters got there. Wow. Reporters didn't show up till about 10 o'clock because they'd been partying all night before. And <clears throat> they came in about 10. Well, hell, then it was too late because of, the, of the, the wind conditions, everything changed. We were going to kick off about six in the morning, so the only people that got affected by the gas were two of our own soldiers, oh, wow. and uh, the civilians were never seen again. I'm down to the last minute, wow. and we're almost we're out of time already. You didn't even get to the, some of the key parts, but so you spent 30 days in this jungle, surrounded. You ran out of food, basically. You guys yeah. were skinny, emancipated, weren't you, when you, when you finally were rescued? I think I weighed in at Walter Reed at 129, I left Walter Reed at 123. Wow. And 30 days, that, did that change your life, that 30 days? Well, it, it, it does. It makes you think, you know, what's life about, how important it is, and how insane war is. War is the absolute of insanity. I, I, and, I would agree with that. And, um, you know, it's, Combat is what ninety percent absolute boredom and ten percent sheer absolute terror. Wow! Well, listen, thank you for coming on and sharing your story. It's an amazing story. Um, there are a lot of amazing stories from Vietnam, and uh, hopefully, it's something we don't repeat again in our lifetime. Well, appreciate being here. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. You've been watching Lakeland Currents, where we're talking about what you're talking about. I'm Ray Gildow. So long until next time. <laughs>